Which brings me to one of the most important parts of this ceremony today, the presentation of our honorary degrees. Our university's mission is to produce very bright people like you to lead our society. As an institution of higher learning, we are also privileged to be able to recognize the achievements of those who have provided exemplary service in their lives by awarding them honorary degrees. It's our privilege to be able to publicly recognize and present to you two such people today, graduating students. Each of the recipients today is brought before you as an example of what you can achieve if you use your incredible assets, your brains, your skills, your heart, your passions, your energies, to the best of your abilities. They bring great honor to you and to Arcadia by allowing us to honor them, but they are here with a greater purpose, to serve as inspiration to you because of the lives of excellence and commitment that they have led. Do not forget who they are. Remember why they are being honored today. And do your best when you leave here to follow their examples. And now, I'm pleased to welcome Patricia Hill Collins, a social theorist whose research challenges us to consider issues of race, gender, social class, and sexuality in our nation. Waldina Pinsky, Assistant Professor of Sociology and Director of Gender and Women's Studies, please come forward and present the second candidate for an honorary doctorate, Professor Patricia Hill Collins. Dr. Collins, please join me. Arcadia University is very proud to welcome Professor Hill Collins to our campus. Dr. Patricia Hill Collins is Distinguished University Professor of Sociology at the University of Maryland. She is also a native Philadelphian and a graduate of Girls High. She is someone whose research and writings are read and greatly appreciated by our students at Arcadia and a colleague whom we consider to be at the pinnacle of her field. Dr. Collins came to national prominence with the publication of her very first book in 1990, Black Feminist Thought, Knowledge, Consciousness, and the Politics of Empowerment, which earned professional acclaim from the American Sociological Association and the Society for the Study of Social Problems. It was the first step on her ascendance to the leadership of her profession. Her second book, Race, Class, and Gender, an anthology published in 1992, continues to be used in classrooms around the world. And I've used it in my classrooms. Most recently, she turned her attention to public education with the publication of Another Kind of Public Education, Race, Schools, the Media, and Democratic Possibilities. Professor Hill Collins. Your work on black feminism is so powerful because the double burden of racial and gender discrimination faced by African American women is not widely recognized or investigated. In Black Feminist Thought, a text I have taught many times, you explored the words and ideas of black feminist intellectuals as well as those of African American women outside academia. Your interpretive framework influenced such prominent black feminist thinkers as Angela Davis, Bell Hooks, Alice Walker, and Audre Lorde, whose work Arcadia celebrated just this past spring. Dr. Collins, you are a distinguished scholar, influential author, path-breaking thinker, and passionate citizen. You transformed the field of feminist theory with the creativity of your analysis. Only rarely does a scholar have such an effect on a discipline. Rarer still is your career of increasingly influential writings. Generations of students, including students at Arcadia, have learned to see their world in new ways through your lens of critical analysis. 
the sociologists, feminists, and activists you have challenged continue to advance the investigations you launched, work that has real meaning for the lives of the people in our society that have been cast off. Dr. Collins, you have also managed to equal the scholarly contributions you have made to the world with the personal attention, investment, and mentoring you have given to the women you have taught. Your beneficiaries and the effects of your work are global. You have pushed society to examine itself with a close lens in the interest of honesty, accuracy, and justice. And my colleagues and I are very pleased that Arcadia University is honoring you here today. For your many contributions to our society and those we know are yet to come, Arcadia University awards you the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters. Upon recommendation of the faculty and by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, I now confer upon you, Patricia Hill Collins, the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters Honoris Causa, with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities thereto pertaining. Congratulations. Dr. Collins, we're honored to have you give this year's commencement address. Thank you. Well, now that I'm a proud alumnus, I can say whatever I want. Is that how it goes at graduation? I would also like to wake up all the graduates who have dozed off behind those sunglasses. Now, I know that was a lot of praise for me, and I loved every word. Thank you so much. And I'd like to thank my uh, family members who are here today, my friends, my lovely husband is here somewhere out there. But this event is for you. So what I thought I would do today is speak from the position of being a native daughter. I grew up in Philadelphia and drove past this school many, many times and never did it cross my mind that I would be here today. For many of you, particularly those of you who are first generation college graduates or graduate student graduates, it probably never occurred to you either. But here you are and here we are. So I'd like to share with you today some thoughts about my own journey that you might take with you. By the time I began my senior year at the Philadelphia High School for Girls, my 11 years of public school education had almost silenced me. Every day I traveled to my overwhelmingly white school that ironically was in my overwhelmingly black working class neighborhood. I rarely spoke in any of my classes. As a working class African American girl, my shot at a better life rested on doing well in school. Because my school catered to middle class white girls, the message was clear. I could stay if I didn't make waves. So I sat and I listened. Now, given my chronic silence, I was surprised when my 12th grade English teacher asked me whether I would be willing to deliver a speech, much like this one, surprisingly, at the Flag Day celebration at Independence Hall. What an honor. As a Philadelphia native, when it came to the flag, I was no rookie. On an elementary school trip, we visited the Liberty Bell and Independence Hall itself. They took us to Betsy Ross's house, telling the same stories to us as to Philadelphia tourists about how her tiny little fingers had struggled to make the flag. This was an important invitation. I knew what it meant to participate in this ceremony held at the birthplace of American democracy. Now, I thought writing this speech would be easy. You've probably had this experience. Oh, a piece of cake. Yet when I got home, crafting it turned out to be far more difficult. All I had to do was answer one simple question. What did the flag mean to me? Now, after all those public school field trips, not to mention a year of Pennsylvania state history, you would think writing this speech would be easy. It wasn't. 
When it came to the relationship of the American flag to its African American citizens, growing up in North Philadelphia and West Oak Lane, not far from here on this also beautiful day, had apparently raised more issues than I anticipated. What did the flag mean to my father, I wondered. His service in World War II left him a proud veteran with a strong commitment to the flag. Yet risking his life to defend the flag provided scant protection from racial discrimination both abroad and at home. His war stories were not simply of battles in the South Pacific, but also his resentment at serving in a racially segregated army. Despite his status as a veteran, the banks refused to grant him the long, low interest loan that was routinely offered to white veterans. My family could not buy the house they wanted in Philadelphia's burgeoning suburbs like Levittown. What did the flag mean to my mother? She rarely mentioned anything to do with politics. By the time I was in high school, she had given up her dream of attending college and becoming an English teacher. Her secretarial job at the Department of Defense helped pay the bills, yet she was never recommended for promotion. Instead, as I discovered years later, she spent years training her bosses, all of them white men who routinely started out as her subordinates. Year after year, she got up and simply went to her job, reading a book on the Broad Street subway as respite and reminder of unceasing work and her dream deferred. So what could the flag mean to me in this context? I was doing all that I could to be ready if and when the doors of opportunity that had been closed to my parents might open for me. I got good grades, was a church organist, a Sunday school teacher, played the trumpet in my high school band and orchestra. I have two witnesses in the audience for that. Put your hands up, please, witnesses. There they are. All right, thank you. And I even made all of my clothes. I was the poster child for black girl upward social mobility, yet I was also plagued by the growing recognition that all was not right in Oz. How was it, I asked, that the flag could signify the lofty ideals of democracy suggested by my public school education, yet my parents and so many others struggled to improve their lives? How many others were there like my mother who never achieved their dreams? But despite my misforgivings, I wrote what I thought was a muted, respectful speech that expressed my true feelings. My speech stated my commitment to the democratic ideals that the flag engendered, which for me meant equal opportunity, fairness, and justice. Yet it also tentatively questioned a flag that symbolized these ideals yet failed to live up to its promises. My speech politely suggested, because you know, I was very polite then, I'm not being polite today because I have a degree. All right, sorry, let me move on. My speech politely suggested, because American society had not yet achieved equal opportunity, fairness, and justice, perhaps we might try a little harder to love up to the flag's promises. I took my speech to my English teacher and waited anxiously while she read it. After a few minutes, she calmly remarked, Patricia, we need to make a few changes. Out came the red pen. When she was done, she said, I've made a few minor suggestions. Please look them over, and once you make them, your speech will be fine. So when I got home, I reviewed her comments. I expected her to correct my grammar, yet was stunned to see that with the stroke of her red pen, my teacher had changed the meaning of my entire speech. Gone was my ambivalence about the significance of the flag and by implication, the meaning of democracy. My speech had disappeared. The speech that she expected me to give was, knee -jerk, was a knee-jerk tribute to old glory. Now I tell you this story on this particular day, at this particular event, in this specific local and, and also global geographic location for several reasons. For, for one, I remember this incident as one of the first times when I risked speaking the truth to power. Yet the issues it raised for me were far bigger than me and, bigger, and also big for you. When it comes to contemporary American society and the globe, but particularly America, that's what I'll be talking about today, we face this slippage between the ideal of democracy and the need to provide opportunities who claim America. Moreover, m the suppression of my free speech points out our responsibilities to speak out about and speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. We preserve democracy by speaking the truth to power. 
whether we are new migrants like many of you who are here today who have families who are new to America, or Americans like my parents whose lineage could not be traced to a recognized nation state due to the circumstances of their arrival. Through our silence, we weaken democracy. When we speak up and speak out, we strengthen it. Now, in the post-9-11 context, we have been encouraged to see democracy as a thing, a finished product manufactured in the West that the United States exports to its less fortunate neighbors. Yet in reality, democracy is a process, a way of building community in order to address collective challenges through collective struggle. It is not bestowed upon us by people at the top, but rather something that bubbles up fr uh, from below from us. Putting teeth into democratic ideals in the U.S. context is a work in progress. The long arc of history suggests that for those holding first-class American citizenship, democracy has been well served. Citizenship status, however, first and second-class citizenship, or whether you have citizenship at all, results in democracy meaning very different things to different people. This is a country that has undergone massive changes since its inception, and it wants to lead the world. Many of its changes have pivoted on deeply entrenched differences of opinion about extending citizenship rights to native peoples, poor whites, women, people of African descent, immigrants, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered people, the differently abled, as well as the old and the young. We're fighting those issues now. Go online and find the news. Should LGBT people be allowed to marry? Should the DREAM Act be passed to offer children of immigrants who only know America the chance to excel? Is the widespread and growing incarceration of young African Americans part of a broader initiative to strip them of their first class citizenship? Having a felony record certainly has that effect. Despite social issues such as these that take different forms for each generation, American democracy persists. Democracy is still here, but that doesn't mean it will stay unless we begin to face up to our responsibilities. I want to point out two challenges that I think we face and that I think you face. First, are you still there, by the way? Now, I do realize those of you who are smart enough to wear sunglasses today are engaging in that wonderful middle class technique of sleeping in class without being caught, all right? So look at those people with sunglasses and just make sure they're awake. Right, just, I know your game out there. All right, just try not to snore. First, two challenges that we face. First, privatization has been offered up to you and to us as a magic bullet that will solve difficult social problems. It's a curious logic. If you as an individual have an individual problem, by your individual solution, you can solve all problems. Hmm, how am I going to stop a war by myself, you see? We, this isn't helping us. We need to consider the ways in which the marketing of privatization may be bad for democracy. The term public has taken a real beating lately. Public places become devalued, devalued spaces that contain poor people, racial ethnic minorities, undocumented immigrants, and anyone else who cannot afford to escape. Our news media regale us when sensationalistic stories of public space as populated by dangerous African-American, Latino, and Middle Eastern criminals and terrorists who have made the public safe, the streets and the skies unsafe, or of undeserving public children from racial ethnic groups and new immigrant populations who consume educational and social welfare services far exceeding their perceived value to society or of poor women whose inability to catch and keep an unemployed man and or refusal to work leaves them married to the state. American society increasingly reflects a reversal. Public institutions in the United States become highly visible locations that increase the value of privacy itself. Now this devaluation of the public has not always been the case. I bring this up as a Philadelphia native. When I visit Philadelphia today, I am saddened and outraged by the devaluation of public institutions. Those of us who have benefited by public institutions wrongly assumed that the opportunities that we received would be there for those who follow us. My 12 years of public school education, however uneven it was in spots, was essential to my success. Dealing with an unsympathetic teacher who red penned my speech was a minor inconvenience when compared to the benefits of getting a first class education. 
any discomfort I encountered pales in comparison with the issues faced by contemporary Philadelphia public school students right down the block. Will their teachers show up? Will there be books? Will it be safe in the lunchroom? Why go at all? I also remind you that Philadelphia has one of the oldest and best public library systems in the nation. Any librarians out there, we need to clap for them. Owning few private books in my home, the public library for me served as a window to the world. As a high school student, I could attend free museums, getting there by riding the bus for free on Sundays. These public institutions were supported by people like my taxpaying parents, who despite the discrimination they faced, knew that other people's children were in fact their children too. I see this devaluation of public institutions and of the very meaning of the public as a special threat to American understandings of democracy. The American public is encouraged to perceive public institutions in second best because such institutions are typically more inclusive and dem democratic. In this context, freedom becomes defined, redefined as not the move into the public sphere, but the move out of it. Now, a second challenge that confronts American democracy is our uncritical acceptance of war as a way to think about society. In the name of protecting democracy, we declare war on everything. We've declared war on poverty. We've declared war on drugs. We've declared war on terrorism. We've declared war on actual people in other countries. Increasingly within the US society, we declare war on one another. This fosters a balkanization of society that says, if you're not with us, you're against us. When you have one teenager shoot another over a pair of sneakers, there's something wrong with a society that allows that to happen. Sadly, our political speech increasingly sounds like the equivalent of gang war. Talk of blue and red states sounds a lot like Crips and Bloods to me. The colors are even the same. What exactly does it mean to be with the conservative, radical, liberal, progressive, capitalist, or socialist team? Is this like playing for a football team where you are promised a bonus if you kill your opponent? This actually happened, by the way. Surely, figuring out solutions to important domestic social issues such as poverty, joblessness, illiteracy, homelessness, domestic violence, infant mortality, and the looming national debt requires more more nuanced analysis than sound bites on talk shows or ideological formulas from the right and the left. Surely, social problems of this magnitude require public initiatives that go beyond the, I got mine, now you get yours thinking. So when it comes to de making democracy work, we all lose when we retreat into whatever gang makes us feel comfortable in order to pursue our own privatized and increasingly narrow self-interest. More importantly, we cheat our children by doing so. What is gained by treating the children of the globe and America's children as hostages in political warfare? Why should they be the collateral damage of our faulty thinking? If they grow up in a war zone, how can they develop the skills to negotiate with people who don't agree with them? If their public institutions fail them, what do they do? armed and dangerous with their finger on the trigger, they shoot first and answer questions later if their behavior is questioned at all. So what can democracy mean in such a world? I don't want to bring you down. It is your graduation. Let me bring you back up a little bit. All right. So what can democracy mean in such a world? Where do we start? I have many suggestions, but I want to leave you with one that seems especially fitting for graduation day. If you care about democracy, make sure that the doors of opportunity do not close after you have gone through. The everyday actions of people like my parents created opportunities that they could not enjoy. I have lived a life that my parents could not even have imagined, yet they, in partnership with strong public institutions, prepared me for it. The social movements of the 20th century, from the anti-apartheid struggles to the global women's movement to homegrown movements to civil rights here in the US, all had a future orientation. They aimed to lay a foundation for those who would follow. Many of us here today benefit from the efforts of countless teachers and parents and relatives and friends and neighbors and good citizens, most of whom we will never know, who individually and through collective action did their part to provide the opportunities that we enjoy. We dishonor them when we look at the, back at the doors of opportunity, watching them close behind us and say, too bad, I got mine, you get yours. 
Now by now, I know, you're probably wondering, how much longer will this commencement day speaker go on? Why couldn't she just give a simple little flag day speech? Enjoy the photo op and move on. More to the point, why can't she just deliver a simple little commencement day speech so that we can move on? I feel your pain. So let's finish up. Let me finish up by briefly finishing my um, flag day story. What advice would you have given me? Should I have delivered my English teacher's version of the speech? Sell out, sell out, sell out. Should I have tried to convince her that my speech was in fact better than hers? Endless dialogue about the benefits of thinking multiple points of view and nothing ever happens. Should I have turned my anger inward, retreating into depression, addiction, or silent suicide? We have lost so many people to that. <sighs> Perhaps I should have pretended to make the corrections but surprised her on flag day by giving my own version, subversive, but then I did want a degree, so I had to rule that one out. Should I have complained to her superiors about censorship in the school? Protest, protest, bad teacher brings down free speech. Were there other alternatives that I had not considered? What would you have done in that setting? Hindsight always provides more clarity than when we are experiencing these moments of indecision. If I knew then what I know now, well, you can think about your own life, love life to fill in that. All right, the end of that. So what choice did I make? You probably guessed. Because I could not see myself giving my teacher's flag day speech, I declined her offer. She didn't try to change my mind. Instead, she simply picked another black girl who was willing to give the acceptable speech. Experiences like this sadden me, but they also have emboldened me, for they put me on the path so that I could reach this podium today. And I hope that by my words, you have gotten some insight about the path you are on and the path I encourage you to stay on so that you could be at the podium in the future, opening more doors of opportunity for those who come behind. Thank you and congratulations. Collins, thank you. I told you, remember who they are. Remember what they said. Follow their examples. They talked about the importance of education, keeping doors open. And as you've learned here over the last years, exploring what is true and speaking truth to power. If you can't do that, then you're not as highly educated as we thought. 